I'm Jessica Ochoa Hendricks. I'm the co-founder and CEO of Killer Snails, which creates virtual reality experiences to inspire a love of science and children. And I am joined by an incredibly fantastic panel of people that are going to begin introducing themselves next. Hi, my name is Marie Graham. I live in Atlanta, Georgia. Um, I hailed my first cab today, I just want to say. I was very proud. Um, I teach humanities in high school. Um, I also run a virtual reality um, a lab uh, where that's content, where they actually create content. Um, and that's what I do. Hi, my name is Lisa Castaneda, and I am a co-founder and the CEO of a philanthropic educational research organization in Seattle, Washington called Foundry 10. And we actually do research in a whole bunch of different areas, both applied work and experimental work. And virtual reality is one area where we have worked with schools across the country and um, also in Canada. Um, for the past three years, we'll be going into our fourth year of studies uh, today. So I'll be sharing some of the data that we found from, from students. My name's, is on? Is this thing on? My name is Steve Isaacs. Uh, I teach game design and development uh, at William Adams Middle School in Basking Ridge, New Jersey. And I think I started at the beginning of the study with Boundary 10 um, when I was very excited because they kind of put it out there as like, hey, we want to hear what teachers would like to do and provided us with these great opportunities to, to work with the hardware and software and, and students. Um, and my primary focus in the area of VR is uh, also in the scope of uh, content creation by students, particularly game experiences. So before we get started, can I just see a show of hands of how many people in the room are teachers? All right. And how many of the people in the room are developers or designers? We have a really nice mixture here. So one of the things that's um, a huge benefit of this panel is the folks up here are both teachers who are currently using it and can provide insight onto how to effectively do that in your own school, as well as researchers who can give you the background of how, uh, sort of an overview of how it's being used across the country and the best practices identified so far. So we're going to ask a series of questions that they'll be answering, and we will be leaving time at the end for you all to ask questions too. So just to start us off, um, how did you initially get past the technical hurdles of bringing virtual reality into your schools? Um, so for me, uh, it was interesting. When I signed up for the study, Foundry 10 was, was gracious enough to provide me with the Oculus uh, Rift SDK 2. And I immediately, when I got it, plugged it into my laptop on my desk at school to realize that uh, that wasn't going to cut it. Um, <laughs> we could do some little experiences, but I mean, talk about like um, performance issues. Uh, they were kind enough to help support me by you know, getting the technology a little up to speed. Uh, so that is definitely a hurdle um, in terms of the higher end uh, you know, hardware. And, in, and then later in the game, when I also acquired some more VR hardware, I went to Donors Choose and had uh, you know, crowdfunded money to get another VR capable computer. I'd like to think we're getting closer to a point where, you know, It'll be possible for you know schools to have technology that will handle the VR, but it's definitely something to get over if you're talking about the higher end. Um, we started very low tech. Um, actually, our first experience was with the New York Times, um, which was pretty exciting. Um, and we just used Google Cardboard. So that was our first experience. Every kid had a phone, um, and that's where we started. And then after that, um, my experience began also with um, Foundry 10, and very gratefully, um, we had an HTC Vive. Um, I was able to beg my way into a gaming computer uh, for my boss. I mean, everywhere he turned, I was there standing going, please. And then, um, and then he got sick of me as my asking, and, and he gave me one. And then, um, and then we started to use it then. And then the now, like much later, when I was began to be interested in um, content creation, that was not necessarily focusing on gaming, but providing experiences for impact. Um, you know, I, there were a lot of hurdles. I mean, the first hurdle at our school was they were like, but you're not a technology person. You don't know how to do it. And I was like, I don't, I don't care. We'll figure it out. And so there were a lot of hurdles, um, and especially the students. A lot of them weren't, um, certainly weren't coders. Um, some were gamers. Um, teachers, even today, that we do have a virtual reality lab and um, have a partnership with Alienware, even then, 
you know, when something goes awry, I'm often called out of class because something isn't aligned, you know, um, and, and I have to go in and fix. So they're, all, they're often technical glitches. Um, what I have found as a teacher is that you have to tell educators to just, just get in there and do it and not to be scared. Tell students to sit down in front of Unity, sit down in front of, Un in front of Unreal and, and learn it and that not to be so timid and scared. Um, so I think the technology, you just have to kind of like bust into it. That's what I have found. And one of the things we found from our research, because the first year our questions had a lot to do with how do you even implement VR into classrooms? And you know, from both of their experiences, there's a huge range. Like we've definitely had educators that were like, but I don't have the funding to get an advanced headset. Can I still do this? I can only get a few phones. Like you mentioned, your students all had phones. We've worked with schools where maybe 75% of kids had smartphones. So then it became an equity issue. So how do you actually set this up in such a way that the 25% of kids that didn't have phones could make use of the cardboards? And another uh, really interesting thing we saw is some of the schools we've worked in have advanced hardware classes where the kids actually built computers for other schools in the district. So they got grants to help build computers. The kids got the experiences of building the computers and obviously building your own PC. If you do it well, you can um, build it for cheaper. So that was another way to kind of bring in that technological learning and expand people's opportunities to use the VR. And I wanted to jump in there too. And another interesting thing is if you have a school or you have an area that doesn't have, maybe even there are only four phones in the room or you only have one HTC Vive or one Oculus, what I have found in talking to a couple of their schools in the area is that you can have stations in a classroom. So you can have a pop-up station somewhere where kids can kind of um, jump in and out of that station and have experiences a little bit at a time. And I've found that works really well. That's great. So assuming now that everyone in the audience has figured out how they're getting their VR um, hardware in place, then can you talk to us a little bit about the sort of digital citizenship guidelines that you provided them before they, they went in the first time? <laughs> so, um, you know, one of, one of the things, I mean, it's, uh, you know, it's really about obviously creating a, a culture in the classroom for starters. In my room, uh, the, so I, I teach game design. I've kind of set my room up as like a game design studio. My goal is to have a lot of different resources for kids, and VR is one of those resources. So we get into a thing where, I mean, luckily, they don't, they, you know, they have to take turns and things, but it seems to be a thing where when, like I like to have kids be able to have a longer experience, and, and I don't like to say, okay, you know, like everybody in the class is gonna have a three minute experience. Um, but what I will do is I'll kind of, do a demo at first, um, you know, orient the whole class to what we can do with, let's say, the HTC Vive or the Oculus Rift. Um, and then little things come into play that are very important. Um, one is with the Vive being tethered um, and there being other people in the space, there's a lot to talk about in terms of having a, what we call a chaperone. So generally speaking, it's a two-person experience. One person kind of holds the leash uh, and the kids get a kick out of thinking they're holding their classmate by a leash, um, but to really understand their role in, in keeping the area s safe. Uh, one of the other things, and, and this is something you actually have to go over because kids think it's, it's funny to kind of like, you know, uh, you know, mess with somebody who's in VR, and that's, that's a, a big issue because we want to really maintain that safety. So we just have real, you know, serious guidelines around that. But, but I think when it's set up from the beginning, they adhere to that. Uh, for us also, with the room scale experiences, you know, there are, we have a lot of things going on in my classroom, so we have a designated space that when somebody is in VR, the rest of the, you know, everybody's supposed to stay out of that space um, and things like that. And then what's really nice about that is then the kids become empowered. Like, you know, once they're kind of trained, I s can step back and the kids set up the VR, they, they help one another out. They invite their teachers in because they now want to share that experience with them knowing how to do that. So I think the empowerment piece is really big as well. And I can't say enough from the research that we gathered from kids and teachers, that importance of setting up that safe environment. It's already a noisy place to be in an educational setting. And we know from our research that some of the things, like you mentioned, time. Uh, we had a teacher in the study, they gave kids 90 seconds. And the kids were so focused on, I only have 90 seconds, that they couldn't actually get immersed in the experience. We also have had teachers who didn't want kids to wear headphones because they wanted to make sure they could be heard the whole time. And that puts them in sort of a dual reality. So they're hearing the classroom and they're seeing something different. And so those are some of the things that we also know can kind of impact that experience. We also know from kids that um, 
sometimes their sense of what VR is going to be like um, developmentally isn't accurate. And so in order to kind of set it up well, we need to give them a sense of what they're going to experience. Because one of the things that we found very surprising from our data was that things we considered relatively innocuous experiences, depending on those kids' like lived experiences, could actually really be unnerving for them. And so one of the things we talk with the teachers in the study about is making sure that they give some sort of a preview. Um, with the advanced headsets, it's nice because like Marie could be in it and I could still see what's going on without being immersed, but setting the tone for like, hey, if you don't like being underwater, you might not like this experience was really important because um, it could be really um, unnerving and upsetting for kids if it was something that they weren't comfortable with. I think also there, there comes that, I mean, you have to think of the idea of digital citizenship. As a high school teacher um, and as a parent, I mean, you know everything that's out there, right? And, and one of the things I did with virtual reality was immediately go home and say, well, what's out there? What happens if I go on in virtual reality and I go to the browser, even with an Oculus Go, which I love, by the way, um, and, I, and I put VR porn? It, I, that comes up, and you are, have access to everything. And you have to be careful because kids have access to this. And these are high school kids and middle school kids as well. Well, and a lot of the humanities teachers that we've talked to also talked about perspective taking and who is creating this content and what are they trying to convey? We, um, in our second year of our study, asked students um, how trustworthy developers were, like how accurate they were, and it was really, uh, developers, they really believe. Like 85% of kids were like, yes, developers know what they're talking about, and what I'm seeing is an accurate depiction. Um, so again, like thinking about yep. how are we helping them to sort of think about the content and what they're seeing and who created it. I agree, uh, but I do think in the school setting, you have to think, I mean, that digital citizenship component and the limits are really important. And I do think that pre-flexion is really important. And also, and also that um, afterwards, that reflection. We know as educators that reflection makes a learning concrete, absolutely. And so whenever there is an experience, particularly if it is an intense one, um, always taking the time um, to, to reflect. And it's not just an additional piece, it is absolutely the most important piece um, and then it, it also can bridge into assessment, which we can talk about later. Mm -hmm. But the no touching thing is also Super key. <laughs> if a child does not feel safe in an experience, um, it ruins the experience. So I think that that was also really important. And also to touch a little further on what I, I think we've been getting at too, is there are some pretty profound um, experiences that can build empathy and can also be you know, somewhat traumatizing. And some of them are being made you know, in conjunction with mental health professionals. And, I think there's a point where we're going to have to really look at that whole idea of where do we bring counselors in for that post, um, you know, for a debrief or, a, a re, you know, a reflection afterwards. And I, I think we're getting into a very interesting space there because it's easy to be like, wow, this seems like an amazing experience. I want my kids to understand what it feels like to be, you know, this, that, or the other thing. But, you know, we don't, like Lisa said, we don't know exactly what their prior experiences are, are or how that might impact that. And that leads nicely to um, my next question, is uh, thinking about how you have your students create VR. I know both of you have been have done that in different ways. So I think it would be really interesting for folks to hear about. Keep looking at me. Um, <laughs> I'll go first. Uh, so for me, I've kind of broken it into um, you know, the concept that I consider creating in and for VR as two very separate things. Um, and it's really neat because there are a lot of great tools for creating content in virtual reality. And I think it's pretty awesome what kids are experiencing with tools like Tilt Brush and they're painting, a, you know, a 3D, you know, immersive painting and then walking through it and things like that. And that's, you know, a very low barrier to entry in terms of that's like a great first experience. There are others like that. Then I've had kids move to um, a couple of other things. And what's really neat in, you know, in my environment is that kids are there to really kind of test the waters and see what is going to work or not work for them and you know, iterate on what's happening and whatnot. Um, so there's one game that I really love called Climby, if anybody's played it. And you're, it's like a rock climbing game. And the th reason I love it is that there's also a level editor where you could build content in it. However, it's also very buggy. So I had some kids working for weeks, you know, creating there and running into silly issues like they could not save their work and things. So in that case, what was kind of neat is they were exploring other options, but they still wanted to stay in that in VR space. So they moved to Modbox and had greater success. So that's another one where it's like almost in between the in, the, the in and for because they're creating experiences for other people to experience in VR but they are creating it in virtual reality. So they have that kind of sense where they're in there 
developing with the tool set and creating game experiences right there. Um, and then we go to that higher level, which um, you know is like, let's say, Unity or Unreal Engine, which I know Marie's done a lot with. Um, in my case, with middle school students, that is a, you know, there is a huge learning curve for my kids, I find, in Unity. And what's been awesome is that I've seen a few kids that have gotten incredibly excited and passionate about diving in head first and really just tackling it. And you know, I get to hear cool things from them like, this was the best experience I ever had and the most challenging, you know, that kind of thing. And you know, I've been able to do things like connect them with, and, and actually, for all of you who raised your hand that you're a developer, um, if you would contact me and offer to help my <laughs> students, I'd be most grateful. Um, we've had a lot of, we've had some success already with developers um, mentoring my students, and I don't really know Unity, but having them have that connection has been fantastic. Um, so there's, you know, and, and I've had some, you know, the, the, the successes are very different in terms of what a kid might create in Unity compared to, say, Minecraft. So the ones, so it's very interesting always to see who's willing to persevere and, and go down that, you know, that route. I think starting from a non-technical, you know, I was a completely non-technical person who just passionately loved virtual reality and loved teaching. Um, we're a school of design thinking, um, and we started with the idea, I had 14 kids in the first virtual reality class in a virtual reality lab, and we started with how might we impact um, the children's hospital with virtual reality, and that's how, where we started. Um, and then we spent about two hours just uh, generating questions. A lot of the kids had been through pediatric rehab for, for you know, different reasons. Um, and once we started looking at those questions, um, we were able to contact someone from the hospital and they came to us. And then we started um, looking at like what we needed to know. Um, so we started with this kind of large questioning. And then we didn't, go, we didn't get to the tools we needed until after we figured out like what were we trying to do. Um, and we designed three different experiences for these kids at the pediatric rehab hospital. And this is with not un knowing how we were gonna do it. Uh, you know, and I kept having the administrators turn to me and going, but how are you gonna do it? And I kept thinking like, I don't know, <laughs> I don't know. I knew you know, what Unity was and I knew what Unreal Engine was and we had a 360 camera and I, I just didn't know. Um, and then what we ended up doing was um, creating three or four prototypes um, the kids who had some coding background were much more comfortable in Unity. Um, and uh, several kids began learning C Sharp, including me at stoplights, you know? Only because my husband told me I wouldn't be able to learn how to code, so I was like, wrong. Um, 47, I had only learned one language, that was the one. I don't think I can learn another one, I honestly don't. But, um, and then some of the other kids um, really were excited about Unreal Engine, and the kids who didn't have a coding background, that was much more accessible to them. I just noticed that right away. I learned enough to get everybody started, and then at some point I came to a screeching halt and we were in the middle of a, um, iterating something for the hospital. Um, it was for mirror therapy um, for kids who were paralyzed, where um, you would put on the virtual reality headset and they were able to move both of their limbs. Uh, it had to do with mirror neurons. We were working with uh, a neurologist and with a physical therapist. We were way over our head. And we were so excited and we were so close and we got stuck. And I mean really stuck. So I went on LinkedIn, I found um, some developers um, and they were, and I just said, can you please help us? We're a school, we're trying to do this. And they said, okay, sure, can you come next week? And I got, this, <laughs> I got the school bus and I, I drove it safely to the um, school. And, and we just walked in, you know, I'd never hung out, I'd never spent the day with developers before. Um, they weren't like I thought. I mean, they all had baseball caps and like jeans. <laughs> we hung out. We had a great day. They ordered a pizza, and we were able to kind of land the plane. And they got out of the seats and let the kids learn how to do it. But that's how we, you know, we get stuck and we need help. We need help. Well, and just one thing from their research perspective, especially for the educators out there, one of the things that surprised us in our second year was we actually asked kids, are you more interested in consuming content or creating content? And a very high percentage, I can't remember exactly off the top of my head, I want to say it was like 70% of kids were interested in doing both. Um, and so even though that dipped a little bit across the course of the year, and we think maybe that was just having to do with some of the creation tools that were available at the time, this was a cross subject area. So even if you're not teaching a technical class, like we've had foreign language kids, humanities kids wanting to actually create content. So just something to think about if you're an educator. And following up on, that, building on that as for you, how have you seen schools across the country, and including both of you, um, using VR in an organic way, in a natural way in their schools? 
So one of the things that we found that's obviously, it seems very obvious, but it somehow gets lost, is having that clear objective. So VR is a tool. Um, and so when teachers come in and they're like, uh, we had an art teacher who really wanted to do 2D to 3D translations. So she had students draw things on a piece of paper, and then she had them go into Tilt Brush and do them in 3D. And she was able to look at, hey, this is what I was trying to do, and this is what they produced. Sometimes with VR, we're still getting that like, oh, it's, it's wow, it's exciting. And you, you get in these conversations with teachers about, well, what were you actually trying to achieve by utilizing VR. Um, and so what we see, at least from the research side, is when teachers have a clear idea, well, I'm putting kids in here, I want them to converse in the target language, which is Spanish, they're going to be giving commands to people who are outside of VR, and this is how I'm going to know it worked. Just really keeping it grounded in that. Obviously, the initial VR experiences can be a little bit more like, hey, try this out. But we see the most um, well-connected, organic work when the teachers really understand what piece of content they're using and what the actual purpose of that content is. For, for me, what I'll say in terms of the organic part is the, the fact that I um, you know, use it as one resource that's available to all my students. So it comes out of, like my, my course is quest or choice based. So kids choose what they'd like to work on. Um, all kids end up wanting to try VR and then it's great to see who wants to go further. Um, in terms of getting started, I have, at the beginning of my course, um, students do a lot of like game reviews and things. So they do that for games you know, of different genres as well as VR content. And when they look at VR content, I just want them to start understanding and looking at it critically in terms of like how immersive is it? What, could we, what are you doing in this experience that you might not be able to do um, you know, without it being in virtual reality? So I want them to just start thinking about that. And again, when we then get to a point where they're much more you know, out there choosing what they're interested in, you see, I mean, which is also great because I have a few kids that the ones that were creating in Modbox, when they came to class every day, they were the ones who were using VR because nobody else, I mean, that wasn't what other people were working on. So there wasn't real competition for it. And they had this tool available to them essentially every day because of that. Um, and then in my seventh grade class, similarly, they all have, it's a shorter course, it's a six week course. So they all have an experience. So, you know, I just do the one demo and once they're up and running, you know, they're all experiencing. And a lot of it's about experiencing the content they want also, because in that environment, I'm really giving them the experience. We're not going that deep into it until my eighth grade course. And can I just jump in? One other thing that we saw with our research as well is just because something is available doesn't mean it's actually accessible to teachers. So one of the things we learned from our study is if you just put the headset out there and are like, hey, kids, you can try this. Um, when we observed classrooms, that wasn't what happened. A few um, typically male middle school students or high school students would go try that. Um, and so again, thinking about how you introduce that as part of an option that is available to everyone. And we found actually in several of the classrooms that we worked in that um, students would want to come in at lunchtime or after school where maybe it wasn't the whole class that was there and they could get a little bit more one-on-one -on -one time with their teacher while trying out advanced VR. That's exactly true. That's a really good point. Um, actually, I got some pushback because I left it, I leave it open during lunch and during enrichment and after school, and they were worried about the equipment. And immediately the administrators were like, well, we want you just to have it open during your class. And I was like, but then the population who uses it completely changes because the kids during lunch, the ones who are more trepidatious to use it, are the ones who kind of like come in when no one's watching them and will come in and use it. And I think that's well, really and positive. And one other thing that we saw in the data as well was that um, you know, if you're only using advanced technologies like VR in your like AP computer science class, the diversity of that sample of students just really shrinks down. We saw a lot more diversity of use when it was put in a social studies class or a foreign language class. And for whatever reason, we're not entirely sure why, students seemed less anxious about trying it in those environments. And we wondered a little bit if it wasn't um, that there isn't really an expectation that you know how to use an advanced technology there. Whereas if you're in your like advanced game design class, you know you didn't maybe didn't want to look like you didn't know how to do it. Um, so just another thought in terms right. of accessibility for student use. I think teachers sometimes just need to have like some ideas presented to them. Um, I got an idea from another teacher. I think that um, I try to read and learn as much as I can, particularly from Twitter. I, I'm just kind of fed from all of the brilliant educators out there. Um, and I always think about the element of surprise. You know, the brain loves stories. The brain loves surprise. The brain loves novelty. And I try to use that with this technology. So for example, um, like we read Persepolis, we read um, some Amy Tan. So what I might do is if I'm reading some Chinese literature, for example, we're in a small group, we're reading it, and then I might have two stations set up, and I might land them in a small you know, village in China. 
I don't tell them where they're going. I just say, hey, um, at some point when you see someone stand up, um, feel free to go and just put on the headset and look around and, and then you're gonna reflect on your journal and we're gonna talk at the end of class. And so there's an element of surprise and novelty and they go and you see them and they put it on and they're like, oh, it relates to what we're reading. They have a sense of place. Um, and it's pretty magical, like those small moments. I feel like those are organic. What I don't think we want to do is turn it into the thing what happened with technology, where we were like, you know, we know worksheets and passive learning. It's like the worst way to learn is to sit and get, right? And then we got computers, and teachers were like, oh, good, we can put worksheets on the computers. <laughs> no, like, and I don't think that that's what we want to do with virtual reality, um, so. Well, and that was one of the things that kids told us in our very first year was that so often when technology crosses over into education, it is used in different ways than when they use it outside of school. And they were like, please don't wreck VR. That was, that was actually literally written <laughs> in kids' responses to us. Yeah, and um, on, on that same note, I, I totally agree with the like lunchtime um, and before school, but also we have a game club and kids use it extensively there. And it, it's just neat to have that casual environment where they can explore that's not, you know, and, and I do think it's interesting because I've had a number of, of female students ask to come in during lunch for that reason you're bringing up, and even before school where there's actually maybe nobody in my room, so it's, you know, very few people, so it is interesting to see those differences. And c continuing along the same theme of using this in teaching, um, can you tell me, or uh, maybe starting with you again, uh, tell us about how teachers in general and how you guys specifically are assessing the impact of VR. So one of our studies for next year focuses specifically on assessment because one of the things we saw in this year's um, cohort of 35 teachers is I think two were actually starting to think about assessment. The whole idea of how do you assess in VR um, seems to give teachers pause. I think a little bit because it is a different medium and so that sense of like, oh, I'm just going to give them a paper quiz afterwards um, doesn't, doesn't feel right. And I think one of the things we've seen as well is it takes a couple years for teachers to get comfortable enough actually integrating it into their classroom to really start to think about assessment. So that's actually something we're studying next year in a couple different models. We have some teachers using um, alternative assessments. We have teachers doing an experimental control style group with just like recall of information. And we have a couple teachers that are actually going to look at assessing someone while they are immersed in, in VR. But very few of the teachers, you might be one of them, and you've actually, you actually have two of you, <laughs> probably the two that have done the, the most with assessment. I think reflection. I mean, I think that that's key um, with assessment and virtual reality. I think um, when a student comes out of any sort of experience that any of you might develop, um, it's it's their uh, it's their ability to be able to articulate and then assimilate that into their learning and to be able to discuss it, and then the creation piece um, to be able to take what they learned and they experienced uh, and then to create something um, themselves out of what they learned. That's the most powerful piece. Um, assessment might be my least favorite word in the English That's language. Too. <laughs> <laughs> um, but the reflection piece, absolutely, and that's what I focus on. So when my kids are writing game reviews or something, I have just quite things that I want them to look at. I want them to look, you know, critically at the content for those things I mentioned before, like the how immersive it is and things. So, in terms of for me, the best thing is to go to have a feedback loop with the students. So they submit a quest to me, and it's either approved because it's worthy of being approved, or I give feedback and send it back, and they iterate on it, and then um, you know resubmit it until it's you know worthy of being accepted. So you have that, and you know, and to me that's important. And it, the same thing happens in the creative piece: is that when like where my kids are you know, in a game design environment, they are uh, creating content, having their peers test it all the time, and then going back and, and, you know, and fixing it, iterating, and all of that. So that's, you know, the best is that when that process is going until they have a completed product. Um, but yeah, but that, I just, that word. Uh. Well, and there's just some interesting, we did a focus group with students in our office and it was using um, Remembering Pearl Harbor. And all of the students had already taken a course that covered Pearl Harbor. And what was fascinating to see was after they had the experience, nearly all of them walked out saying, oh, you know, I didn't actually get before that blah, 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 or oh, now I better understand, you know, 
fill in X. And so it was interesting to start to think about like what type of learning is VR actually providing? Was it like disproving some misconceptions that they had? Was it helping them to link um, ideas that they already had? So there's some really interesting ideas there, but again, getting at that assessment piece is, is tricky. I think also, um, I think what's interesting about Pearl Harbor, that experience, is also with the vibe you're walking. Um, and I think that using that space, we know that learning is tied to movement. And that's also research over again. We see that again and again. And when students are moving, I feel like they're learning more. When they're interacting, I feel like they're learning more. We know that, and I don't know about the studies with virtual reality necessarily, but we know interactivity and movement. So I wonder sometimes with Pearl Harbor if that is part of the learning and that. Well, and just one note for developers also um, is, and I'm happy to talk more about this because it's one of my favorite topics. Um, when, when we think about cognitive load, like the amount of input that students are actually getting while they're immersed in VR, um, some of the more educationally oriented content sometimes is very, very heavy on load. There's, you're moving, you're, we've got words, you've got images, and, and we can actually detract from and actually take students backwards in their learning if they aren't able to sort of parse through that information. And so I think VR is an interesting technology in the sense that in some ways it should actually lighten cognitive load if it's done well because you don't have to read it, you don't have to translate those things in your brain. But if there's too much input or students can't control parts of their experience, even if they can walk around, it's just it's too much and they, they leave and they didn't get what you were hoping they would get. Um, we're going to open it up for questions in just one minute. One last thing, a quick go round of um, resources that you have used to find both experiences that you are that your kids are consuming as well as creating. Well, I mean, for one, my my professional personal learning network has been tremendous. Um, you know, I I'm fairly active on Twitter, and um, there are just so many people out there so excited and passionate about education in general and VR and. There's a community, and with Foundry 10, you know, I'm introduced to other educators that are involved. Um, so I have, like, uh, if anybody knows the knows Mark Suter, um, he's doing incredible work with content creation in VR. So you know, I'm always picking his brain um, and and things like and watching what his kids are doing. Uh, and like I said, also the looking out to professionals in the industry, I think is so valuable for our students. Um, I don't, you know, I could never. Uh, you know, have enough knowledge or, or know-how to guide them in everything that they we would want to be working on. So when I can find a resource that's real authentic like that and bring that to my students, you know, and, and then finally, learning with and from my students has been incredible. So, you know, if there's a, a student doing something that I haven't, you know, been able to do yet and we kind of figure it out together, that's been been really powerful. So I would say, you know, mostly it's it's that network of other people that are out there and you know everybody here falls into that so thank you I mean I I love um, I, I agree with you I mean I'm always on Twitter always asking people I would definitely call Lisa if I had a question sorry <laughs> I always call you first um, but New York Times within um, something new that I'm playing with is big screen VR which is really interesting um, because you're able to watch something with other people and then interact with them that's new that's an oculus go. Um, I noticed that uh, tilt brush is amazing. I mean, it's just amazing. Just to even have you know, younger people, you to draw a house, now stand in the 3D house. I mean, that's that's amazing. Also, Sculpt VR, Block, which is Google, um, any of the creation software. I think it's not so much what is there, but for my students, I like to ask them, what is not there? You know, what is not there? What needs to be created? And I guess that's what you're asking as developers, right? Um, so. Yeah, I think that's our biggest complaint area from teachers and our research is that they're like, I spend a ton of time trying to find stuff and I'm not sure, and it's expensive. So if you spend $30 on Modbox and it turns out Modbox isn't what you need, that, that's a significant amount of money for, for teachers to be spending. So I know that, you know, uh, like Viveport is trying to do more with, with education. I, I mean, Google obviously does a big push for education, but I think that's an area for industry to really think about is how can we better curate information for teachers across these different content areas so that it's easier to find one a couple of things too that I found recently is um, Google has their it's a project well so there's the there's web VR now so it works especially well I think with the Firefox browser but there, so there's a lot of content you could view on the web which is makes it very accessible and there are some neat projects out there that for one um, you can uh, create and contribute to that community but it's also just kind of short neat things to show what you can do with VR. I mean, there's one that I was playing, I think it's called Musical Forest or something, and you're, it's like a music, like you're 
creating instruments out of these blocks and things. And it was just like one of those quick finds that was really pretty cool. And also back to you know the students having them make recommendations about what tools um, or products we should bring in is is important because you know they're the ones that are hope we're hopefully piquing their interest. So with that, we're going to open it up for about ten minutes of questions. Um, go ahead. I know you've had your hand. Uh, sorry, the lady behind you had her hand up for quite a while. Question for Lisa. In, in Crescent Lance research, we did control studies, and we found in terms of academic knowledge, um, it was about equal. But what we did find in uh, the three different <coughs> world that kids cared more about something. They felt, because they felt they'd been there, they developed a, a relationship to it and cared more. And I'd like to know that that's part of what you're going to research in terms of assessment. Yeah, that's actually, I forgot to bring that up. <laughs> um, yes, absolutely. And you know, the data that we've gotten so far has been really interesting because last year we asked kids, is VR a good tool for me to learn about people and is VR a good tool for me to learn about places? And it was a Likert scale, one to seven. And the responses were really mixed pre-post. So with the, the places, kids really felt like, yeah, I'm connected to places, I understand place. People was a lot more lumpy. And so this year, um, this last school year, we asked kids why. And we're getting really mixed. We're right in that data right now. But we're getting mixed responses. Um, so it's something about the place-based data does make them feel more connected. It situates them. They're like, oh, now I understand what it's like in this place. But a lot of the kids are still writing to us about the people part, saying it's not the same to see people in VR. And so one of the things we've seen teachers doing um, is you know, we had a school where the kids did some work with refugees in VR. And then they actually reached out to UNICEF. And then they actually raised money and they connected. Um, Marie's done stuff where her students have connected to other people in other places. And we're wondering a little bit if, there, if the VR, again, is a tool to kind of take a step in that, but that there's still that sort of getting connected to, to people piece that looks a little different. And so we are going to delve more deeply into that still, because we're still not satisfied with the data that, that we got. But I, I do think that there, there is something there, but there's a nuance to it. So when people just sort of blanket say, it's great for, for empathy, at least with adolescents, we're like, eh, but how do we know that? Yeah. I wonder if it's that you don't stop there, and I think that's that mm -hmm. that's the point. Um, I had kids who literally, I was trying to reach them, we were talking about refugees, and um, I showed them The Displaced by New York Times, and I it was the most powerful thing I had done with them, and it's what got me into virtual reality with the students. They Their language changed. The way they spoke about these people changed, um, and then we immediately went right into a project. It was a segue into a um, PBL, um, and it was very powerful, but I think it was that follow through maybe that was the important thing. Um, so what would you recommend the length of time that students should be exposed to VR in kind of an innocuous way before delving into something, something that is a little more, um, a little more pithy in, <coughs> in terms of the topic that so I don't know, this might give a start to the question. So one of the things that we found was um, it's not that you're kind of inoculating them towards the content. You're helping them feel comfortable in the virtual space. Yeah, so we definitely encourage people to start with like Tilt Brush or like the blue or, you know, if you're in advanced headsets where it's things where you can control it um, or you don't have to do a lot with it. It didn't matter how much exposure they had had if the type of content was going to be something that was triggering. So for instance, um, there were some students that were really really excited about like roller coaster VR. And then they wrote to us about how I hate roller coasters in real life. I did roller coaster VR and it was horrible and I hated it. And you're like, well, <laughs> you know, you didn't you didn't like this. And so something even like that, um, you know, I, I watched a class that did a solitary confinement experience in VR and the kids were prepared for it and they they went in and they came out and they debriefed and, and it was it was a fine thing for that group. So I think, you know, part of it is that they have the some experience actually navigating the virtual space, but that with every piece of content, particularly if it's something that's that's a little bit um, more questionable, I guess, in, in, in nature or something more intense, that it's really still important to like revisit that. This is what's going to be in here. Is this some? If you're you're not sure, you don't have to do it. We always talk about that. You can always opt out and do something different. On the, to on the topic of inappropriate content, I wonder if it'd be helpful if the VR makers were to offer a kiosk mode. Lock out everything except the content you want to offer. Mm -hmm. So you hit the home button, you never end up back in a place where they can start buying things. Or, yes. You know, I, think, yeah. this is, this <laughs> I have teenagers. I think if the, yes. if the teacher community were to add their voices to this, it might actually find out. Yeah. That'd be great. We 
yeah, but it's school, of course. Um, but it would be great for us. No, the vast majority of schools in our study had one or two. And so they typically used a stations-based model or, um, you know, the other thing we've seen that works really well to kind of get around that, that time idea is so uh, one art teacher, she happened to have two vibes, but 35 kids in a class. And so they would sign up um, sometimes two weeks in advance for their 15 minute slot to go create. And it worked because then the kids could relax because they knew they had their slot. Um, so almost none of the schools, I think maybe there's three schools that we work with that have multiple, maybe four, multiple, multiple headsets. But yes, the stations model tends to be the way to work. I was just going to add to another thing to think about, and this kind of addresses your question again, is what's your objective? So yeah. if um, your objective is to create and you want to be using advanced headsets, that's great. Um, we've had a lot of classrooms where they're like, I just want to have small groups where kids are paired up together right. and can have a discussion. You know, And so thinking about, do I, do I need an advanced headset? Can I do an intermediate headset? We have schools where maybe they got an Oculus Go, and then they got a Vive, or they had a few Google Cardboards, and right. we could even set up different types of centers. So that's another thing to think about, too. What are you trying to achieve while the kids are immersed? Or even three you know, you can um, borrow, you can even borrow a 360 camera that aren't that expensive, and then you can learn how to, and that's a really a good place to start. And I think you had talked a little bit about starting with, didn't you talk a little bit about using 360 camera? Because that's a great way to start with content that's not that difficult. I, I haven't done too much with actually 360. What I, what I do want to start doing, and maybe that's what we were talking about, is um, Google Tour Creator. Um, was recently released, and that's free to create, you know, Google um, Expeditions experiences. So for that, I mean, 360 and having kids, I mean, imagine, you know, so the kids go on a field trip, right, and they take 360 photos, and they come back, and, and the kid who might not have been able to attend the field trip can now maybe experience. And that that's a really, I think, a low, um, you know, entry point. You know, it's pretty reasonable. Um, so I would, uh, you know, that would be a great starting point. And then again, what I said is from a just one of the first experiences kids have in my class is something like tilt brush. So they're creating, they're getting a sense for what's possible, and that's a great springboard, you know, to move from.
we're, I, and I have a question for you too. Um, so we're putting together our curriculum for that two-day course. We've taught others through safety and also uh, XR, different, different things you can try. And it's really two days of experimentation. What would you suggest for me as an educator of educators? What, what are the, the takeaways you think are most important that we make sure that they come out of their two-day training, understanding they can take back to their classroom? I, I did a, a training recently in a school district where what most of the day was was sharing the different, you know, kind of types of experiences, having the attendees. I mean, I, I was lucky it was 10 participants. I don't know how many you're going to have. And they worked in small groups, so they experienced the content, and then they unpacked it as a group afterwards, like talking about, you know, you know, kind of getting really digging into, like, by the end of the day, how can I, what can I envision using in my, doing in my classroom with this? And hopefully, I mean, the idea was they each were supposed to come out with um, a plan for, hey, if I have access to it tomorrow, this is what I'm going to have my kids do first. And I think, not to beat a dead horse, but this idea of helping them understand that the learning needs to be made explicit. So this was something that we talked a lot about from our research when we did game-based learning as well, is that just because you put the kid in the experience doesn't mean they're going to make those connections. And so I know it sounds redundant, but like to remind, because sometimes it just gets exciting um, when you're doing it for the first time and you see all these possibilities. And again, having them start small with like, what is one unit or one thing that you can do? How do you know that it's doing what you're doing? And how are you going to talk about that and make that learning explicit with your kids? And allow for wild experimentation. I think teachers, especially like teachers, even though that's what we do for a living, um, to understand to fail up, just fail up, to, to feel like they can try something completely new um, and to not feel so hesitant. I think that it's scary when you're in this new technology and you don't have a technology background to be able to feel like it's okay to dive in. You know, we ask students to do it all the time, but it's, you know, at 47, like still feeling like I can do that. Final question. Um, so, great question, and thank you for bringing it up. Um, my kids also have opportunities to do experiences with AR. Uh, one of the things that's been really successful from a creation standpoint for us, um, I don't know if anybody's familiar with Metaverse AR. Uh, there's an app that has all the experiences, but the interface to create for it is on the computer. And you're creating essentially an AR experience, usually like a kind of like, um, it almost feels like you're generating a web you know, to connect things. So you're, you're learning programming as well, but it has all these different uh, modules you could bring in. So the kids are creating an AR experience. Um, I had a student create like a, uh, a narrative, uh, like an interactive fiction experience that had, you know, both the question component, but also the AR, you know, with visuals and things. So that was, that was pretty exciting. Um, and, you know, there are other, gosh, there's so much, um, there are, well, AR kit, which I want to explore more deeply is another creation tool, but uh, and you know what the gentleman was talking about this morning, you know the New York Times, some of those AR experiences are looking very exciting. I don't know if you've had any. Um, this year we're I mean, we are we're go we're going to be moving towards that, and um, <laughs> I'm going to figure it out. I mean, that's that's what's going to happen. I've already reached out to the community, and that was the other thing I was going to say to you. Reach out to your community. Um, you know, there are people, meetups, and people, and if you um, get into that community, they will just uh, envelop you with open arms. And then I just listen. I get in with people, the developers, and the, all the people, you know, doing all the exciting work with VR and AR, and then I'm quiet, and I just listen, and I'm just <laughs> taking notes, and then you just learn so much, but it's just such a welcoming community. Yeah, and, and like you said about the developers, I mean, I've had the, the metaverse developers Skype in with my students and do a demo of how to use it. I mean, that was just terrific. So. You know, people are so, especially especially a lot of these smaller, you know, companies that are really, you know, glad that you want to get engaged in your class. So with that, thank you all so much for taking the time to lead this panel. <laughs>